I really appreciate being here. Uh, I, I will start uh, by saying that uh, when uh, uh, Cormac uh, gave me the uh, task of presenting something about hydrocephalus and especially shunted hydrocephalus in children, uh, I wanted to uh, have a way to uh, give it to this audience. Uh, you guys don't need uh, a lot of hydrocephalus knowledge because most Chiari patients don't have hydrocephalus, but some do, um, and especially the complicated ones. And some of them have pseudotumor cerebri, which is a form of increased intracranial pressure where the ventricles are small. So I figured I would give it the spin of education because this is what you all do. This is what ASAP is built to do, is educate the lay public about significant neurological illnesses that uh, often require surgery. And um, I decided instead of having a dry review of the literature, i will give you my own experience, what, I've, what we've had to struggle with, what we've tried to improve, uh, to, to give you a taste of how complicated uh, uh, this, this topic is, and that it's never uh, you can never uh, ask enough how we can uh, make it better. So I'll start by showing the people who don't know what hydrocephalus is. Hydrocephalus uh, basically means that the ventricles uh, are enlarged and um, the, uh, the ventricles are the chambers that carry the spinal fluid in the brain. And um, on, the, on the left, you see enlarged ventricles. On the right, you see shunted ventricles, where the ventricles have decreased in size because of that shunt tubing that you see. And in the middle is a child who has the typical sunset eyes that you often see with hydrocephalus, with severe hydrocephalus. So there are a variety of causes for hydrocephalus and pseudotumor cerebri. Uh, trauma and meningitis can cause hydrocephalus. Uh, tumors, cysts, hemorrhage, infection, as well as congenital obstructions, such as a Chiari malformation uh, or different cystic uh, problems in the posterior fossa. So uh, the um, difficult part of what uh, we struggle with uh, over the years is this concept of when you do have hydrocephalus and Chiari malformation, which came first, which caused the other. And I will tell you that uh, in my training, as well as I know in most of neurosurgeons' training, we've always been taught to treat the hydrocephalus first because the Chiari has to be secondary. In fact, when Professor Chiari uh, published his initial finding, he felt that the Chiari was uh, a, a result of hydrocephalus, of increased intracranial pressure. Until this patient came along. And this is a, a child who came in with high pressure in her head, papilledema, which means the eyes uh, are getting damaged because of the pressure. And she had both a Chiari malformation and hydrocephalus. And I was going to put a shunt in. And then I found out that her brother has Chiari and her father has Chiari and syringomyelia, neither of whom had hydrocephalus. I figured that has to be a hydrocephalus family uh, a, a Chiari family, not a hydrocephalus family. So it wouldn't be logical for me to treat the hydrocephalus. So I did a posterior fossa decompression. This is before, this is after, this is before, this is after. The hydrocephalus went away, the papilledema went away, that was 10 years ago. And since then, I've seen several uh, children with this particular phenomenon. Now, just like exactly Dr. Morasco was saying before, Chiari comes from various etiologies. You could have increased intracranial pressure that results in Chiari, but what I will tell you is that it's much more complicated than this. Sometimes you can have a Chiari that can cause enough obstruction of the frame and magnum to cause hydrocephalus. So over the years, uh, initially, the, the goal of shunting was to save kids' lives who have uh, hydrocephalus that is going to eventually cause neurological deterioration and possibly death. We did that, or they did that, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, what remains, however, is a set of very complicated children with 
with, where the, the brain is being shunted abnormally for years and years. They develop a variety of, of problems because of what we do. So now the goal is to optimize the survival of these children as opposed to just save their lives. And uh, this is a shunt in case uh, people have not uh, uh, seen one. A catheter goes into the brain ventricle, there's a one-way valve, and then it, it goes somewhere in the either abdomen or chest or other places. So the primary goal of shunts was to save lives. Now our primary goal is to optimize it, which means optimize shunt, malfun uh, shunt function and optimize the survival of these children. So we would like to minimize shunt malfunctions. The problem is that of all the diagnostic tests that we have, none of them is 100%. And I'm going to show you some examples of this. Uh, there are complicating factors. Sometimes it's difficult to know if someone's shunt is working or not because the child is developmentally delayed. He may not exhibit the, the exact signs that someone who is otherwise normal, normal mentation would. And the solution, uh, and this is the area of education I'm telling you about, is organized partnership. So what uh, Leon was saying earlier is, is absolutely the right way to go. Interdisciplinary clinics where there's collaborative uh, not just with neurology, but uh, with rehab and with the family and primary caregivers. And the specific solution is those multidisciplinary clinics uh, where we uh, do surveillance imaging, outpatient follow-up, familiarize, familiarize the patient with the neurosurgeon. It's really important that, that if, if the child develops a headache at 2 in the morning, the, the parent is not going to a question or be hesitant about calling the hospital uh, because they don't know the neurosurgeon very well. Uh, enhance family comfort, enhance family education, when to call, whom to call, what to expect, and enhance uh, the primary caregiver's education and communication. In other words, education. And education, I believe now in, in the uh, second millennium is the primary lifesaver and enhancer of, of, uh, of function in kids with hydrocephalus. Um, starting with how did, how did all of that start? In the 1950s, John Holter, who was the father of a child with hydrocephalus, went to the neurosurgeon, Dr. Spitz, and he said, what are you going to do about my child? He has high pressure. How are you going to treat him? He said, I have nothing to treat him with. There's no way I could main, uh, decrease the pressure through some kind of a mechanical device and maintain the pressure I need in the brain. So he was a machinist. He questioned that this is not appropriate, it's not acceptable, that my child's going to die because of lack of technology. Uh, he tried a few things at home. And he made a valve from silicone rubber that had never been implanted in a human before. It was only used on planes. And what happened is that prior to that date, 9% of children survived to age 10, and all survivors were mentally handicapped. And beyond, after 1958, 86% started surviving to age 16, and 40 to 60% of those had normal intellect. Made a, a dramatic move. So when, when you guys fund research, in your area, this is what that research does. And, and the people who are emotionally connected are the best at promoting the type of research that you really need. The problem is some children still die. And what do we do about this? And this is a case study, not to scare anybody, but a 16-year-old who had a shunt since infancy, never been revised, who had days of headaches, everybody assumed that she didn't need her shunt because it never failed. Three days later, she came into the emergency department and died on arrival. This is a nine-year-old girl that came in uh, sleepy with a headache. We took her to the scanner, and on the scanner, she herniated. She blew both pupils. 
If that had happened half an hour before, on her way to the hospital, she would have died. Instead, that's her now. She goes all over the world and does medical missions. Uh, near misses, very close calls. Some of them have not been as successful. Like this fellow, he was in the hospital. But because he was developmentally delayed, the nurses could not figure out that he was actually worse. His mom had had to go to work. He, was, he had a seizure. They looked on the chart. He has a history of seizures. He died three hours later from shunt malfunction in a hospital bed. So it brings up issues of how to assess patients with abnormal baseline, how you need to communicate with the families, how education is a, is a primary factor in why this particular child died. So we looked at this starting when I was in Jerry Oaks's program as a fellow and found that there were 28 shunted kids that died specifically of hydrocephalus, of shunt malfunction. And the question that I asked at the time is, could we have prevented this? And I went back to the health records uh, in, in, the, uh, in Jefferson County at the time and looked at, at the names of the patients and went back to the hospital records to figure out what it was that went wrong. And what I found is that 10 of the 28 patients had symptoms of high ICP for at least 24 hours. And five of those had symptoms up to four weeks prior to dying. And five had inadequate follow-up. Now, whose problem is this? Is this the uh, family that didn't bring them to medical attention? Are they neglectful of their children? Is this the primary caregiver that didn't know that they need to send these children to a neurosurgeon? Or is this the neurosurgeon who did not give proper follow-up, did not educate the families enough to make sure they understand that this is a life-threatening disorder and that you don't wait until the next day when there's a headache? Six years later, the same group looked at the follow-up six years to see what kind of deaths there were. And there were only four. And, or, or seven, but four, yeah, four in the total population. And what they found is that there wasn't a lot of difference in the technical problems that, that were happening. There wasn't a lot of difference in the amount of support that these families had at home and, and their primary caregivers. The difference was in education of those families by putting up nurse practitioners on the phone to take phone calls from these families anytime they have a problem, anytime they had a question. This is what saved all these lives. So shunt failure can be life-threatening. The solution is routine follow-up. It's not that I'm going to discover shunt malfunction on that date that they come see me in clinic once a year, but they get to know me, I get to know them. Familiarization with the neurosurgeon and nurses, and routine communication with primary caregivers or education. So next, you look at the variety of tests that we use to document or try to figure out if, that, if someone's shunt is, is working or not, from head CT to shunt series to shunt tap, et cetera. And I will tell you that none of these are 100%, which means that a lot of time we struggle to figure out what's happening with this particular child, especially knowing that the, the rate or the frequency of headaches in this patient population is higher than normal. So we did a study on this after a couple of these cases came about. One-year-old boy with hydrocephalus, his scan was normal. He was sent home. Mother called back in. She said, I don't care what those ER folks are telling me. This shunt is not working. And she was right. The ventricles did not enlarge when the shunt failed. 
12-year-old who had a severe headache and bradycardia, his scan was normal. I placed an intracranial pressure monitor. The pressure was 50, with normal being less than 15. Small ventricles, normal ventricles. So the, what, what we're discovering is that the ventricles may not dilate when the shunt fails, or may not dilate early enough that you'd discover them on time. And so up to 30% of those head CT reports are misleading. And I'll show you the studies we did. We looked at 100 consecutive shunt revisions, all of which were proven to not be working in the operating room. So non-functional shunts proven to, f to have failed. Uh, and then I went back and looked at the reports from the radiologist of the CT scans prior to that surgery. And I found these words. All of these were in reports of CAT scans in children whose shunt had failed. So, again, potentially misleading reports in 30%. Solution, families, emergency room physicians, primary caregivers need to know that shunts, when they fail, they don't need to dilate the ventricles. Well, this is new data. How are they going to know that if they don't communicate with the neurosurgeons? They're not going to keep up with that kind of literature. This is what you can uh, emphasize at routine follow-up clinics, uh, ample discussion with the neurosurgeons, neurosurgery team, and routine communications, primary caregiver education. The third topic I'd like to address is, well, now we're you know, getting with the program, figuring out how to deal uh, with, with these situations, how to save these patients' lives, how to improve them, how to diagnose them. And then we put up hundreds of CT scans, each one of which will increase your lifelong risk of cancer by 0.07%. So imagine if you had 10 CT scans a year, like some of these kids do. So we've adapted a, an MRI protocol that we called Quick Brain MRI, which is actually based on fetal imaging. This is the same technique that they use for, uh, for fetal MRI because a pregnant woman isn't going to be on the scanner for an hour. And uh, the advantage of it is that there were, uh, the, the whole scan takes 15 seconds or less. There is minimal motion artifact. So if you move in a CT, there's motion artifact. In MRI, there isn't. No sedation is required, and it has pretty good anatomic resolution. Not like a one-hour MRI, but, but pretty good. This is one of my patients who's moving in the scanner. And we've captured him moving in the scanner. And these are the images that we got out of it. Sagittal, axial, coronal. All the technologists had to do is center the images. One was in the right corner, one was in the left corner. Just center them. But there is no movement artifact. And when we looked at the numbers, we found that in, in 11 of those children, the radiation, uh, the cancer risk was decreased by a quarter percent uh, in 18 months. And in the most problematic child that I just showed you with, that had 10 MRI scans, because he's not had 10 CT scans, we've decreased the risk by more than a half a percent. That's in, in an 18-month period. So uh, finally, um, shunts, as much as we try to improve them and, and do good diagnostics and help these kids, they are frustrating. They are prone to error. They are prone to complications. And we'd like to get rid of them if we can. So this is where endoscopy came into play in our field. So neuroendoscopy has really revolutionized pediatric neurosurgery in the past 20, 25 years. It helps us minimize shunt catheter malpositioning, simplify the shunt, and sometimes even get rid of the shunt. And I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. This is a child with tiny ventricles, slit ventricles, 
And uh, this is an example of endoscopy inside the catheter, ventricular catheter. Endoscopy outside of the catheter, you can follow the track and see what is wrapping around the catheter, for example. This is uh, an example of navigating through tiny ventricles with the endoscope. You no longer have to blindly try to place the catheter. This is going through the same track that was there before so that we don't damage more of the brain. Again, navigating through small ventricles. And then if you have asymmetric hydrocephalus, instead of putting two shunts in, we end up with one shunt and fenestrate the septum between the two ventricles, which is what we're doing here, and communicate it to the other side. So that's what endoscopy has been able to, uh, to allow us to do in shunted hydrocephalus. But then there are a variety of other things that we can do. We can take out cysts with the endoscope, so that we don't have to place a shunt in this child, and he doesn't need a craniotomy. This is before and after. We can take out tumors before and after, and a variety of other techniques to treat obstructive hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus that's based on obstructions within the ventricular system. And those children should not have shunts anymore. So, there's been significant improvement in, in the care of kids with hydrocephalus and shunts, significant advances in technology, multidisciplinary clinics are key, consistency, consistency in management is key, but more importantly, educating patients and families about all these novel treatments, all of these novel diagnostic methods and, and our knowledge uh, uh, about them and educating other physicians, all under education. So thank you for this. And if anybody didn't know this, if you turn Michigan upside down, you end up with the badger.